podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people? That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest, I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I am going to make this probably the fastest introduction we have done on the show because today's episode is about distractions and focusing your attention. And I'd rather just have you focus on an incredible interview. This week, we interview Nir Ayal. And Nir currently writes, consults, and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. The MIT Technology Review dubbed him the prophet of habit-forming technology. He founded two tech companies since 2003. He's taught at Stanford which is also the place that he received his graduate degree. And he is the author of the national best-selling book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. We are talking about his newest book, which is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. I could go on and on about how much I learned and how much I'm going to implement, but I've decided to just let you have it. Before I do, though, I want to remind everyone If you're enjoying the show, if you're feeling like you're in the Christmas or holiday spirit, please consider going to patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast and becoming a patron of Smart People Podcast. With that, you get a bunch of great perks, including ad-free episodes. We are creating a community over there, and we would love to have you join. Much more to come on the Patreon front. With that, I want to say thank you to Miguel for joining us on Patreon recently, and a special thanks as well to Timu. I know you're out there. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your incredible donation. Really want to say thanks on that for supporting the show. All right, we are interviewing Nir Ayal as we talk about his incredible new book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. Enjoy. All right, well, Nir, first, I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. And and I'm actually, I've been excited to have you on because a good friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Levy, who has been a two, maybe three-time guest on the show, introduced us. And I'm curious, how did how did you all uh, come to to meet and and have, you know, be on his podcast and things like that? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Wish no, I, I, I it's been kind of it. a whirlwind here with this book launch, you know, with, with, uh, indistractable it's, uh, it's done great. We, we sold over 150,000 copies in just two months. And, uh, uh, it's been, it's been really great. The reception has been fantastic. And I've, I've done a lot of podcasts and I, I don't yeah. remember how we first met to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just curious if it went back because this is really in his wheelhouse. And the reason I bring him up, our, our listeners loved him. I mean, we got some of the best response to, to his interview. So I was just curious about the connection there. You mentioned your new book, Indistractable, and also you, you've got a previous bestseller, Hooked. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I really think that you have done something a lot of authors strive to do and, and honestly fail, which is it's newer information. I mean, you actually, if you read review after review on Amazon or uh, just in general, talk to people, they'll say, you know, this wasn't a book that's just a summary of information I already knew. And I'm curious, when you set out to write Hooked, what was your end goal? And did you think it would be such a force in the space of really how to make habit forming products and apps and services? Uh, with my first book, with Hooked, that is? Yeah, with Hooked. Yeah. So with Hooked, it was really about how can we steal the secrets of these huge Silicon Valley companies that are so good at capturing our attention? How can we use those secrets uh, for good? That was really the motivation there. Uh, you know, I've never worked. Some people think I, I helped these companies. I, I never have worked for these companies. What I did was uh, to take what what they do and democratize it so that anyone can make any sort of product and service into a habit. And the idea here is is exactly what, what's happened over the past five years. Companies like Fitbod have get gotten people hooked onto exercising in the gym. 
Uh, Kahoot, the world's largest educational software, uses the Hooked model to get kids hooked onto in-classroom learning. Uh, some of my clients include the New York Times, who I helped get people hooked to reading the newspaper. And so that was really the idea behind why I wrote Hooked, is that I, I could see that many of these, these companies were really good at capturing our attention, and I wanted to distill down how they did what they did so that the rest of us could benefit from it as well. I love that. And well, one of the things I read was coming out of grad school, you started a company that was based on Facebook marketing, I believe. And correct anything that I get wrong, but I'm curious if is that the spark where you did you instantly go, wow, I wonder why people click here or do this, especially in the digital world? Yeah. Today, when you say Facebook marketing, I think it has different connotations because people think Facebook ads. What we were doing, this was back in 2007, where when you said apps, apps didn't mean uh, iPhone apps because iPhone apps didn't exist. The Apple App Store didn't uh, occur, didn't come out until 2008. And so what we were doing is to help figure out ways to uh, help game makers on Facebook because uh, this game ecosystem on Facebook was exploding at the time to help try and figure out how to help them uh, monetize their games. And that was done through advertising inside their game with what we called virtual goods. Today, virtual goods is a multi-billion dollar industry. But back then, nobody was doing it. <laughs> and so wow. that was that was what we were doing back then. And uh, it was it was exactly as you say, it was because I had exposure to uh, not only the gaming industry, not only the advertising industry, but also on top of these social media companies that I had this front row seat. Many of the people who helped build these companies were my friends and uh, some of them were my clients. And I, I had this front row seat to try and understand how these companies are designing their products to make them so sticky and so habit forming. I'm really curious about how you feel about social media and specifically the what we now know as Facebook marketing today, given how you really were in at that early level and what it sounds like is it was just out of interest and passion and all those things to what it's become, which really is the, you know, the antithesis of what you talk about in Indistractable. What, what do you think about the role of social media today and its goal in taking our attention? Well, I think um, there's there's like every complex topic, we want simple answers and the answers are never simple. It's never black and white. It's never good, good versus evil. If you want good versus evil, I don't know, watch Star Wars or something. It's just <laughs> not that simple. Um, you know, the, the, it's clear that, uh, that social media uh, can, can have some negative repercussions. We've seen this in terms of election interference and data mining and uh, even the company's monopoly status. These are all good questions we should ask of the tech industry. But we also want to make sure that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I would argue that a lot of the techniques that, uh, that are used to keep a product engaging, we can co-opt those techniques. We can utilize them to help people form healthy habits in our lives. And so we don't want to, we don't want to harp on the techniques. We don't want to harp on what makes these products engaging because we want that, right? Are, are we, do, do we tell Netflix, you know, stop making good shows because I want to watch them a lot? Do we tell Apple, stop making your, your, your iPhone so user-friendly because I like to check it a lot? Do we tell Facebook, stop making the news feed so interesting? No. We have to take matters into our own hands. And so I think while I agree, you know, Paul Virilio had this great quote, this, the philosopher. He said, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. And I think that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, but, but what's the solution to that, right? The, is a solution to stop sailing ships? No, you make ships better. And so that's exactly what we see here with many of these technologies is that they come bundled with all sorts of problems, all kinds of unforeseen consequences. And so it's our job to do two things. What we've always done as a human species is we adapt our behaviors and we adopt new technology. So we adapt and we adopt. And I think that's exactly the process we see happening right now. And frankly, you know, why would we wait? I think a lot of people about this problem, particularly of distraction, in my wheelhouse, just to be very clear, I'm not a social critic. I'm not somebody who, you know, looks at all the, the goods and bads. I really focus on this one area uh, where I struggled in my life, which is around distraction. And I started this journey thinking that it was just about the technology that was distracting us. And what I discovered in, in the bulk of the book is actually not about tech distraction. The bulk of the book is really about the root cause of distraction. Because, you know, when it comes to distraction, most people fall into two categories. We have what we call the blamers and the shamers. The blamers are the people who say, it's technology, it's Facebook, it's Instagram, it's email, it's the chocolate cake, it's whatever outside of me that's doing it to me. 
the shamers, this is what I used to do. Uh, we shame ourselves. We say, there must be something wrong with me. Maybe I have a short attention span. Maybe I'm, I'm lazy. Maybe I'm an imposter. I don't know what I'm doing here. And we do all these, the, we, we tell ourselves these terrible stories that of course just makes the problem worse because the more shame we feel, the more likely we are to seek out distraction. And so we don't want to be blamers. We don't want to be shamers. We want to be claimers. Claimers acknowledge that these things aren't your fault. You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent email. You didn't invent the chocolate cake, right? But they're not, while they're not your fault, they are your responsibility because they're not going away, right? What other choice do we have? And so I would argue that we have a lot more agency than we think. So a, a claimer claims responsibility for their actions. They determine that they are going to do what they want, what's in their best interest, as opposed to letting their life and their attention and their time be controlled by other people. That's what being indistractable is all about. Well, and, and I love you take that approach in indistractable. I want to get into that because as many of my listeners know, I teach for Franklin Covey. I facilitate workshops and, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people. Habit number one is be proactive. And what it essentially means, people get it wrong sometimes on the surface. They think be proactive means go out and do things. But in reality, proactivity is not at all that simple. What Dr. Covey intended and what we, we talk about and teach is being proactive simply means accepting the results that you get, mm. good, bad, or whatever. It's your response to a situation that is important and within your control. It is not the external thing, which is a lot of what indistractable is about. Right. However, right. and we can just dive in, and there's a couple of other questions I wanted to lead up to, and I'll get to those, but- that also makes it sound like we should all or or could all be blamers because it gives this this idea of willpower, right? And that's that's what you're talking about. And I know this all too well as a blamer. It's this just means I don't have enough willpower to do the things I say I want to do. As a shame. Where, where do you stand blame, on this right? idea of willpower and focus and being indistractable? So sorry, you said as a, as a shamer, not as a blamer. A blamer says it's it's the computer, it's the technology, it's Facebook. You, you mean as a shamer, right? Um, well, the the one, and I might have the the, the wording wrong. It's the one where you tell yourself yeah. that it's your fault. Yes. Okay. So the shamer, and by the way, this is this is me, <laughs> or yeah, at least yeah, it, me it was me. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I'm going. Uh, the the book is really full of of surprises. I love to turn over apple carts, particularly when it comes to the psychology of why we do what we do. There is so much folk psychology out there, and uh, a lot of it is untrue. Not only is it untrue, it's unhelpful. And I think this concept of willpower, uh, you know, people who, who study this stuff, we're increasingly realizing that maybe the whole concept of will willpower is flawed. And so I don't like this I idea of willpower. I don't think it's very helpful, and I don't think it works. Uh, self-control, willpower, self-discipline, even those words kind of just send shivers down my spine because they tend to fail. In the moment, they don't work. I mean, think about it, right? If, if the chocolate cake is on the fork on its way to your mouth, you're going to eat it. If the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're going to smoke it. If your cell phone is on your nightstand and you sleep with it as far away as you do from your lover every night, the first thing you're going to do is pick it up because you've already lost. If you have to depend on willpower in those moments, we know the outcome. They're going to get you. And so the book is really about how do we not utilize willpower? How do we not depend on self-control and self-discipline? Because those things do not work. The people who I studied over the past five years, and I talked to hundreds of people, the ones who didn't struggle with distraction, the ones who were indistractable, the ones who did what they said they were going to do day in and day out and lived with personal integrity, they weren't the ones who had the most willpower. They were the ones who had a system in place so that they didn't need willpower. If there's one mantra I want people to remember, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Our species has a gift that no other animal on the face of the earth has, which is that we can see the future with greater fidelity. We can predict what is going to happen better than any other creature that has ever crawled the earth. And we can use that gift to help us prevent from getting distracted. So it doesn't matter how delicious the chocolate cake is. It doesn't matter how, how enticing a distraction might be, whatever algorithms these tech giants develop. It doesn't matter. We are so much more powerful. Why? Because we can take steps now 
to prevent getting distracted later. That is our superpower. That is our ability. So it's really about systems instead of self-discipline or, or willpower, self-control. In fact, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about uh, this idea that a lot of people still carry around, which is that willpower is a depletable resource, that willpower, you lose it throughout the day, right? That it's like gas in a gas tank. And in fact, this, this theory has a name. It's called ego depletion. And there was a, a, a researcher who actually studied this, uh, one particular scientist who studied this and showed that, oh my goodness, you know what? There is really this effect that people run out of willpower like gas in a gas tank. And let me tell you, tell you what this looks like. So for me, I would come home from work and I'd say, oh, I'd have, I'd have such a tough day today. I'm spent. I just, I, I need, you know, I no more willpower left. I, I deserve to sit on the couch and eat my Ben and Jerry's and watch some Netflix. How could I possibly be expected to have any willpower left after such a day like this? That's what ego depletion sounds like. And so people took this, this these studies that showed that, look, ego, you know, th that the willpower does actually deplete like gas in a gas tank. And this perpetuates, and you still hear some version of, of it or another when people say, you know, manage your energy, not your time, things like that. It's, it's very, it comes out of some of this research. Until... A group of researchers a few years ago now decided to try and replicate these studies. They said, let's, let's run these again. This is what we do in the scientific community. We don't take things on faith. We rerun the studies. Well, they rerun these studies, they reran these studies many times, and they could not get them to replicate. And so it turns out that the scientific consensus today is that the concept of ego depletion is not true. We do not run out of willpower like gas in a gas tank, except, except for one group of people. The work of Carol Dweck, you might recognize her from her great book, Mindset. She did this research over at Stanford and found that in fact, there is one group of people who do actually exhibit will, uh, this, this idea of ego depletion. They really do run out of willpower like gas in a gas tank. And you know who those people were? Shamers. The, no, no, almost. <sighs> they were the people who believed in ego depletion. Uh, the pe people who did believe, oh, I'm spent. Those, in fact, were the people who exhibited this phenomenon. And so what this tells us, this is very, very important. What this tells us is that we carry around with us all kinds of self-limiting beliefs, right? That I'm not, maybe I'm not really good enough. Maybe I'm lazy. I have a short attention span. I'm a morning person. I'm a night owl. I'm a this, I'm a that. We carry around all of these self-limiting beliefs. Most of them have no scientific basis whatsoever. And in fact, they backfire. Let me tell you the latest of the batch. The latest of the batch is what you hear in the news, in the, in the media every single day. Facebook is addicting you. Twitter is hijacking your brain. Whatever technology, fill in the blank, is mind controlling you. This, we see this every generation. Every generation has their boogeyman. And this is, this is what was so revealing to me in my research in that, I thought distraction was a new problem. And in the course of my five years of research, one of the first things I discovered is that Plato talked about distraction 2,500 years before the iPhone, right? Plato was talking about 2,500 years ago, boy, isn't the world so distracting these days? Wow. <laughs> and so every generation has this conflict of blaming something either themselves or something outside themselves as causing distraction. Now, there's no doubt about it, that, that the world is more distracting today than ever, that if you're looking for a distraction, you're going to find it. But this notion that it's, uh, that it's addicting all of us, that it's hijacking our brains, that is rubbish. It is not true unless you believe it's true. So when we believe, there's nothing I can do about it. You see my kids, they're all addicted to video games. The algorithms are controlling my brain. Facebook, the iPhone, they're all doing it to me. Guess what happens? It leads to what we call learned helplessness, and we don't even do anything about the problem. How many people out there say how distracting things are, and when you ask them, well, what have you done to try and fight distraction? Um, crickets, nothing. So I think it's time to stop complaining, Time to stop waiting for the geniuses, uh, our politicians, to do something about the problem. Don't depend on that. If you hold your breath waiting for the politicians to do something about the problem or waiting for these tech companies to fix the problem, if you hold your breath, you're going to suffocate. 
So instead of waiting around, why don't we do something about it ourselves? And you know what? It took me five years of research to uncover. This was actually just four steps. And it's really not that hard. If you know what you're doing, we can get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. And we can do what we say we're going to do by becoming indistractable, not just when it comes to technology, but in all domains of our life. And now let's take a quick break for this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by Ashford University. Getting your master's degree can open up a whole new world of opportunities. Better jobs, more advancement. A master's degree can help you be a whole new you. And now's the best time to make it happen with help from Ashford University. We've all got things that get in the way of higher education, whether it's family, work, or just the million things that we have going on. Well, Ashford University is convenient and flexible. Their online master's degree programs allow you to learn at your own pace. You can study wherever you're the most comfortable learning. Ashford University's six-week-long courses allow you to take one course at a time. Being enrolled in one class at Ashford means you're considered a full-time student. And let's not forget easy enrollment. The GRE, GMAT, and other standardized test scores are not required for enrolling at Ashford University. Ashford University is fully accredited by WASC Senior College and University Commission. So listen up. New opportunities are right around the corner. Now's the time to start earning your master's degree. Enroll now by going to ashford.edu slash smart. That's ashford.edu slash smart to start your master's degree today. One last time, ashford.edu slash smart. New year, new you. 2020 is your year to tackle that degree. And now back to the episode. There's so much there. And now I'm like, oh, what are all the questions? Okay, here's one right off the top of my head that I, I need clarification on. You mentioned how Plato talked about distraction, and yet that was 2,500 years before the iPhone and things like that. My question, though, is you also wrote a book about how to build products that form habits that some would consider distracting. And let me, let me pause just for a quick second. So the products I help people build, I don't think they're distracting. Uh, you know, how is, how is a fitness app that helps you go to the gym a distraction? You know, there's only one case study in the entire book. In the entire book of Hook, there's only one case study. You know what that case study is? The Bible app. The Bible app is one of the most popular apps that nobody ever talks about. It would be worth billions of dollars if it was a publicly traded company. And if they monetize through ads, they don't. But... I talk about in the book how the Bible app uses the hooked model to get people into the habit of reading the Bible. I think that's a, a good habit. <laughs> if that's according to your values and according to your schedule, I think it's wonderful. So there's nothing wrong with getting people hooked to a healthy habit. I think we should do more of it, in fact. I mean, what if we could use technology to help us live better lives, more connected, more healthy lives? I think that would be a wonderful thing. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm not at all. I, I completely agree. I think, like you said, you can't tell Facebook to not improve their product or Netflix. I mean, I love Netflix. So I, I have nothing wrong with hooking people and, and doing it in a way that serves them. I guess what I was alluding to is the same people that use this model for good could also use it to build distracting products, for example, right? Like a candy crush, which some people like, but some people might consider themselves addicted. So and there's no blame here. It's not even, I'm not even blaming the people. What I am asking is, and you did answer this, you said it's more distracting today. But my question is, do you think that we have gotten so, so uh, clear and so intelligent in regards to the brain and how it works and, and, and neurotransmitters and reward systems that we can fall, we can ad, uh, addict people far greater to temporary drug hits, such as you know a, a serotonin drop or something, than we could have twenty five hundred years ago at like an exponential level. Or, or does the research show no? That's not true. Yeah, so I think it's important we decide what we are, what we mean when we use this term distraction. I think that's that's a good place to start because um, I think the best way to understand distraction is to understand the opposite. Of distraction. So the opposite of distraction is not focus. If you look at the entomology of the word, the actual opposite of distraction is not focus, it's traction. So traction and distraction both come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So the model I talk about in the book is, is, this, uh, is this number line. And to the right, 
you have traction. To the left, you have distraction. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. Now, the opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do, things that you are not doing with intent. So why do I give this dichotomy? I would argue there ain't nothing wrong with playing Candy Crush. Why is Candy Crush morally inferior to watching football on TV? Give me 100% one reason. agree. There's no difference. <laughs> if you plan to do it, enjoy it. The yep. difference is whether you are doing it with intent, whether you are doing it according to your values and your schedule, or whether you are doing it on someone else's schedule. And that's what a distraction is versus traction. If you plan to sit down and watch some TV, go for it. If that's what you wanted to do, if you want to check Facebook or YouTube or Candy Crush or whatever, that's traction as long as you plan time for it. What is not traction, what is distraction is anything that you didn't plan to do. So I would argue that sitting down at your desk, this is what I used to do. I'll, I'll walk you into a day in my life before I wrote this book. I would sit down at my desk and I would say, okay, now I'm going to work on that big project. Now I'm going to do the thing that I've been procrastinating upon. Now I'm going to do the thing that I finally, okay, I won't put it off anymore. Here I go. I'm going to do it right after I check email. Yeah. yeah. Right? Day yeah. after day after day, I would do this to myself. And I would argue that email in this circumstance, again, the, the, the action itself is neutral. The technology is neutral, right? Email is no different from playing Candy Crush. The difference is at that moment, email was a distraction. Why? Because I planned to do one thing and I checked email instead. So email, this thing that, and this, I would argue that is a more pernicious form of distraction because you don't realize that distraction has tricked you right? We think, oh, it's, you know, if, if you play Candy Crush at your desk, okay, that's clearly, you're not supposed to be doing that at work. That's a distraction. But when you check email, when you didn't intend to, we lie to ourselves. We let distraction trick us into thinking it's what we want to do, even when we don't. That's a really, really important insight. So I would argue that we need to stop thinking about these things as, oh, this technology, good, this technology, bad. Anything can be a distraction and anything can be traction as long as you make time for it with intent in your day. And I show you exactly how to do that in the book. So I would argue that, you know, your question around, is the technology becoming more pervasive and persuasive? Absolutely. And if you are looking for distraction, you're going to find it. No doubt about it, just because it's so ubiquitous. But here's the thing. You're way more powerful than these companies are. Why? Because you have the gift of forethought. There's nothing that Zuckerberg can do. There's nothing that Facebook or the iPhone or any of these tech companies can do if you take steps in advance to put them in their place. And that's exactly what I show you how to do. Absolutely. And I love that message. We've been hearing it time and time again. I really think this idea of mindset, mentality, belief systems is the new, it's the new black. You know what I mean? It's the new thing because it, it's, it, it's empowering. I mean, we, we interviewed somebody who talked about uh, mental illness and how much of it is, is something that we can actually um, deal with through our thought process as opposed through a chemical imbalance. Mm. And it was fantastic. And it's one of the most listened to episodes, but at its core, it's a message of empowerment that we are stronger than we are giving ourselves credit for the more we learn about the brain. And that's really, I think at the core of what you're talking about. So let's, let's jump into this because one of the things that I struggle with is why do I procrastinate things I tell myself I actually want to do? Yeah. And a perfect example, which I know 100% you can identify with, as can every guest and almost everyone listening, is I want to write a book, right? Mm -hmm. And I have everything teed up. I've got people who want the book written. I've got the content. I've got the want. I've got the vision. Sitting down and writing is more painful than jamming knives into my foot. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So- Here's the thing. If we want to answer Plato's question from 2,500 years ago, which was, why do we get distracted? Why do we do things against our better interest? And by the way, in the Greek, he called this akrasia. And so what is the nature of akrasia? Why do we do things against our better interest? I think we have to start from first principles. I really like first principles thinking. Uh, you're probably familiar with it from Richard Elon Feynman. Musk. Yeah, Elon Musk. And he quotes Richard Feynman, talked about this a long, you know, well before then. And so really let's start from first principles thinking here. Not only why do we do things against our better interest, why do we do anything? 
what's the nature of human motivation? And most people will tell you some version of carrots and sticks. We've all heard this, right? That everything we do is about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Freud said this. This was called the pleasure principle. Turns out it's not true. That we do not do things for the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. But in fact, everything we do, we do for one reason. And that is to prevent discomfort. Everything we do, it's pain all the way down. Even the pursuit of pleasurable sensations. Hung, or, you know, the drive for, for pleasure is itself psychologically destabilizing. Wanting, craving, lusting. There's a reason we say love hurts. All of these things destabilize us psychologically and create this discomfort to get us to do what the brain wants us to do. This is called the homeostatic response. Think about it physiologically. So if you go outside and it's cold, that's not comfortable, so you put on a coat. If you go back inside, now it's too hot, you take it off. If you feel hunger pangs, you eat. And if you're stuffed, oh, you ate too much, that doesn't feel good, you stop eating. So everything we do physiologically is prompted by this desire to escape discomfort. And I argue that psychologically, the same exact thing is happening. So when we're feeling lonely, where do we go? We check Facebook. When we're uncertain, we Google. When we're bored, we check stock prices, sports scores, the news, Pinterest, Reddit, all of these products and services cater to this uncomfortable sensation. So what this means, if all human behavior is prompted by desire to escape discomfort, and we know this to be true neurologically, there are two systems in the brain, by the way, the liking system and the wanting system. And it turns out that you don't have to like something in order to want it. We've actually seen this with lab experiments with, with lab mice, that even when we disable the liking system, we can get lab animals to do things because they want it, not necessarily because they like it. Right. If you've ever, you know, uh, around holiday time, if you ate a big plate of food uh, over Thanksgiving and you don't even like it anymore, but you keep eating. Right. That's exactly what's going on. Your wanting system is taking over, even if you don't like the thing you're doing. So it's not about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. It's this it's this the fact that everything we do is about a desire to escape discomfort. So that means if all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. Let me let that sink in. Time management is pain management. It doesn't matter what techniques you use to try and manage your time. It doesn't matter what latest life hacks you're using or guru's techniques. At the end of the day, this is where we must begin. That to become indistractable, to ask ourselves, why don't I do what I say I'm going to do? What is the nature of a krasia? How do we answer Plato's question of why do we do things against our better interests? We must start by asking ourselves, what uncomfortable sensation am I looking to escape? So bringing it back to your question around the book, why aren't you doing it? You know you want to, right? Mm -hmm. Your rational mind is telling you, yeah, I totally want to write a book. Mm -hmm. But when the time comes to sit down and write, it's so interesting, the words you used. You, you, what did you say again about how, <laughs> how painful it was? Zooming knives into my foot. <laughs> there you go. Talk about pain. <laughs> and there's your answer. That's why you're not writing is because you ha don't have the tools yet to cope with that discomfort so that it leads you towards traction rather than distraction. What you don't want to do is to try and it, it, to, to modify the pain, to escape the pain. This is what we do with distraction. When we feel that, that uncomfortable sensation, boredom, anxiety, stress, fatigue, loneliness, whatever it might be, we have conditioned ourselves to escape it. Right? We use a technology, we turn on the TV, we think about sports, we whatever. We use these things to escape our present reality so that we don't have to feel these things we don't want to feel. And so that has to be the first step is to have a new set of tools that can help us cope with that discomfort in a healthier manner or to get to the root cause of why do we feel that discomfort and fix the source of the problem. Those are only two choices. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This week's episode is brought to you by ShipStation. The holiday rush is coming, and if you sell stuff online, you better get ready with ShipStation. With more people buying online than ever before, you have to be able to ship orders out quickly, efficiently, and affordably. But how do you keep track of all those orders? Or decide which shipping carrier to use? Or if you're getting the best rates? Luckily, ShipStation can help. With just a few clicks, you'll be managing orders, printing labels, and getting those products out the door and delivered in time for the holidays. 
Getting started with ShipStation is so easy. You select your selling channel, your shipping carrier, your label layout, you pick your ship from location, and that's it. You're ready to go. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation brings all your orders into one simple interface. ShipStation works with all the major carriers, including USPS, FedEx, and UPS, so you can compare and choose the best shipping solution for you and your customers. They even offer big discounts on shipping costs. No wonder ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less time with the best rates available. So listen up. Take the hassle out of the holiday shipping this year. Let ShipStation help you handle it with ease. Just use our offer code SMART to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free holiday shipping. Just visit ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in SMART. That's ShipStation.com, and enter offer code SMART. ShipStation. Make ship happen. And now back to the episode. Why do we feel this discomfort? So getting back to that first level principles and using the book as an example, you would be trying to get to the root cause of why is writing at its core or why is writing this book or, and this goes for anyone. I mean, everybody identifies with this. So why is the thing that I want to do causing discomfort in the first place? Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. So, so how do we go down that? No, 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 not, not we. Let's get personal here. Let's make for a really good episode. I love it. I am an open book. Yeah. So what happens when you sit down to write and it's, and you, you find that, that feeling of jabbing knives into yourself, Mm -hmm. what's going through your head? What's the internal trigger that you're trying to escape? Why is it so painful? I can tell you right away. The first thing is do, do, is what I have to say worthy of being written and will it come out the right way? Beautiful. Beautiful. That is so fantastic. The fact that you right away knew exactly what was the source of the discomfort. It was insecurity. Yeah. It was the fear of social judgment. Are people going to think this is any good? Now that well, you know- Am I going to think it's any good? I mean, that's yeah. one of the things I really struggle with. You can tell yeah. yourself you have something to say, you have something valuable to add, but until you do it, it's just, it's just your story and right. putting it out there for yourself to judge, at least in my world, is is just as terrifying. Beautiful, right. So what, what you would do now that you've identified that discomfort is either fix the source of the problem or learn tactics and or, I should say, learn tactics to cope with it. And there, there's going to be other internal triggers. Believe me, I've written two books. Yeah. It never gets easier. There are <laughs> always times when it's boring and hard and, and I'm feeling like I'm insecure uh, whether anybody's gonna like it. Maybe I don't even like it, like you said. And I look for escape. I'm desperate to just, let me just Google something or let me just research this one book or whatever it might be. So the idea is after you you understand that that is your internal trigger, what you want to do is to reimagine it, okay? So you can either fix the source of the discomfort. For example, one way to disarm that discomfort might be, and this is where we're kind of jumping to the, the, the answers here. Normally, you, you would spend more time on introspection a bit. But one thing could be to say, look, I'm not going to publish this. I am writing this for me. What would that do to your fear of not writing something good? Well, it doesn't have to be good, does it? If you never publish it, you know, if you, if you write a journal, when you, when you write in your diary, do you, do you care if it's any good? No, it's only good or bad based on other people's judgment of it. Sure. And so there, that's one, you know, very simple thing you could do is to try and fix the source of the problem by disarming that source of the pain. Okay. But I would argue that even when you do that, let's say, and you say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to write for the sake of writing. I'm just going to do it for myself it's still going to be boring at time. It's still going to be stressful. It's still going to be, you know, other priorities aren't going to be on your mind. What do you do? You want to make sure that you track these distractions, okay? Because every distraction only has three potential causes. Either it's an internal trigger, right? In which case you have to either fix the source of the problem or learn tactics to cope with it. We can talk more about that. Or it's an external trigger. Your kid comes into the room while you're writing. Your boss calls you. There's some ping or ding on your phone from Facebook or a news alert, right? Those are external triggers. Lots we can do to fix those. Or it's a planning problem. That's the only three causes of distraction, internal triggers, external triggers, and planning problems. And when it comes to planning problems, that's you know second to, the second step after mastering the internal triggers the second step is to turn our values into time and this is this is a very prevalent problem you know i interviewed hundreds of people 
to write this book. And everyone who I talked to who struggle with distraction, every single one of them made the same mistake. They did not keep a time boxed calendar. Turns out two thirds of Americans don't keep any sort of calendar. One third of Americans keep some kind of work related calendar, but almost nobody yet keeps a time box calendar. And I'm on a mission to change that. A time box calendar is when you have a weekly tempra- template for how you spend every waking minute means you account for, you plan how you'd like to spend your time. Why is this so important? Well, here's the thing. If I look at your calendar and there's white space on it, don't tell me you got distracted because (laughs) how can you call something a distraction if you don't know what you got distracted from? So it is absolutely critical that we make a template for every minute of our day. Now, does that mean that every minute of our day, if we fall off track, that we beat ourselves up? Of course not. It means we look back and we say, okay, every week is an experiment. And my job is to make the ideal weekly schedule so that I can make it easier and easier to not get distracted. So every week you revise this calendar according to these three things. How can I make sure that I have the tools in my toolkit to get past the internal triggers? How can I hack back the external triggers? How can I make sure that a planning problem doesn't get to me? That if something takes longer or shorter than I expected, do I adjust that accordingly so the next time I don't get distracted? So every week you're revising that calendar, but this step of making a time box calendar will change your life. It's an incredibly important technique. Not only do we make the calendar, but we also have to synchronize our schedule with the various stakeholders in our life. And I show you how to have a conversation with your boss, how to have a conversation with your, your spouse. It will, I mean, it saved my marriage. I can tell you that. And it will make you so much more productive at work. And especially when it comes to these more creative tasks. You know, the fact is that most people, when they want to write a book, when they want to, you know, do something that requires sustained effort, it's really about playing the time. I hear so often, you know, I want to leave myself the freedom to be creative. I want, I want to make myself available to whenever inspiration strikes. Bullshit. Yeah, exactly. It it doesn't work that way. You know how you write books? You sit your butt in the chair (laughs) and you say, I'm going to do nothing but this task for a set period of time. That's how you get stuff done. And so that's imperative because it has to be on your calendar. Let me ask you this because I, I, like I mentioned, I mean, we believe in a very similar planning process and having taught literally thousands of people how to plan based on our research, which has been going on for decades. And, and trust me, it all tracks with what you're saying. I, I'm, I'm on board. One of the things I found is how hard it is to get people to plan in the first place. And it all goes back to, in my opinion, the internal triggers slash dialogue, you know, and I forget the exact phrasing you used, but you've got the external, you've got the planning in the internal. And and that's why I think your book is, is getting that traction because people realize whether they, they want to or not, that it's, it, it all starts from within. So I really would love to spend, you know, maybe the remainder of the time talking about that managing that inner control, inner dialogue, because it's really easy to say plan and everyone could do it from a, from a perspective of tactically, how do we get over this thing that people will not plan? And in my experience, it's because then they have something to hold themselves accountable to. How do you get past the, you know, the inability to even do something like planning to do the work you want to do? Yeah, no, this is exactly right. That's why the very first step has to be before you do anything else, master these internal triggers. Because as, exactly as you said, you know, if you use these techniques, by the way, there are four big steps just to run through them so everybody can get the picture. Yeah, so the first step is to master the internal triggers. The second step is to make time for traction, which is all about turning your values into time. The third step is to hack back the external triggers. So all the pings, dings, rings, and things that might take you off track, that's the third step. And the fourth step is to prevent distraction with packs. And so this is where I get into the idea of making pre-commitments around the idea of self-image and how identity can shape our future behavior. Those are the four steps. But part, you know, it took me five years to write this book because I I had to look through so much research, so much, everything I do, by the way, is is based on peer-reviewed studies. It's not, oh, here's my personal, you know, technique du jour. No, no, no. I need it reviewed in in a journal in order to quote it in the book. And so- uh, th- not only was it important to have the right techniques, it's also imperative to do them in the right order. Because exactly as you said, if I meticulously plan my day, if I turn off all my notifications, if I let everyone in the world know not to bother me, I've done everything, you know, to, I, I go into a cave and I do nothing but sit there with my pen and paper. If I haven't figured out why I get distracted, guess what? 
I'm still going to get distracted. (laughs) And this is partially what I did, by the way, before I learned about all this research and how to do this, I did think, oh, it's just the technology that's doing it to me. I blame something outside of me and I got rid of my iPhone. I I bought myself a flip phone uh, that that did nothing but send call, you know, send and receive calls and text messages. I got a word processor from the 1990s that had no (laughs) internet connection. And I thought, okay, now that's it. I've gotten rid of all these distractions. I can finally concentrate. And guess what? I still got distracted. I'd, I'd take out the trash. I'd clean my desk. I'd see a book on my bookshelf and say, oh, you know what? I should probably look back into that. That might be useful to me. And I would still get distracted. The very first step has to be to master the internal triggers. And let me just give you a few techniques. There's three big pillars when it comes to mastering the internal triggers. Reimagining the trigger, reimagining the task, and reimagining our temperament. But a, a very handy technique I can give you right now, anybody can use today to call themselves indistractable, is this. It's called the 10 minute rule. And this isn't something that I invented. This comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. It's decades old research. And the idea here is that instead of using what we call strict abstinence, strict abstinence is when you tell yourself, don't do something, right? And strict abstinence tends to backfire, especially with things we can't escape from, right? So while strict abstinence can work for you know illicit drugs, and even then it doesn't always work, but it's very hard to say, if you're on a diet, I'm never gonna eat. You have to eat. You're going to starve. It's, it's impossible. You know, one of the trends that you hear a lot of authors talking about these days is to do a digital detox. Yeah. Ugh, what a load of crap that is. Are you kidding me? You're saying I'm going to put away my technology for 30 days? I'm going to get fired. I can't stop using technology for 30 days. Who can do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't want some academic telling me to put away my technology for 30 days. It doesn't work because I will get fired. Instead, what you want to do, instead of strict abstinence, is to use this 10 minute rule. And this is just one of many, many techniques. Let me be very clear, this is one technique. So it's one arrow in your quiver that you can use. Here's how the 10 minute rule works. Instead of telling yourself not to do something, let me give you a perfect example of why this fails. I want you right now with all your might to do something that you have not done all day. So it's not gonna be very hard to do. You haven't done it all day, I bet. But right now, I want you with all your might, not, whatever you do, do not, Think about a white bear. What are you doing right now? What are you thinking about? I I saw the polar bear. (laughs) (laughs) See? See what I mean? So this is what happens with strict abstinence. When we tell ourselves, don't do it, we are actually, it's like pulling on a rubber band. We pull that rubber band, pull, 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 pull. Eventually you can't pull it anymore and it it releases. It doesn't just stop where it started. No, not where you pulled it from. It actually ricochets even farther, right? It goes across the room. Why? Because we, it's just like when we tell ourselves not to do something, we say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, okay, fine, I'll give into it. And when I relieve that tension, remember what we said earlier about how all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort? That relief of telling yourself not to do it <sighs> feels good. And what you've done is reinforce the very thing you are trying not to do. So instead of strict abstinence, what we wanna do instead is to tell ourselves, I can give in to that temptation in just 10 minutes. And for those 10 minutes, your job is to do what's called surfing the urge. Your job is to just stay present with that sensation, whatever it might be, boredom, anxiety, fatigue, uh, fear, whatever it might be that you're experiencing, your job is to either stay with that sensation, get curious about it, not contemptuous, don't be a shamer, just curious about that sensation for 10 minutes, or before that clock has run out, get back to the task at hand. And what you will find is nine times out of 10, if you just give yourself that emotional space, you will see that emotions, these uncomfortable internal triggers, they are like waves. They crest and then they subside. They feel like they're gonna last forever, which is why we impulsively look for something to distract our minds from what we really have to do. But if you just sit with that sensation, I'll, I'll sometimes take out my iPhone and I'll literally say, set a timer for 10 minutes, I'll put my phone down, And my choice is when I'm ready to get back to the thing that I wanted to do, wait for the timer to go out. And while I'm doing that, I'm I'm contemplating the sensation. I'm getting curious about it. And you will find, I mean, it works like a charm. Nine times out of 10, by the timer, by the time the timer has gone off, I'm back to what I wanted to do. This week's episode is brought to you by Audible. It's the time of year when everyone is traveling or running around getting thoughtful gifts for the people you care about. Think about giving yourself the gift of Audible membership. Now is the best time to do it with a special offer of 53% off your first three months. Access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. 
You can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two exclusive Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else. Listen on any device, anytime, anywhere with the Audible app. It's great while commuting, at the gym, walking your dog, or during your holiday travels. With Audible, you'll enjoy easy audiobook exchanges in your own audiobook library you keep forever, even if you cancel. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash smart or text SMART to 500-500. Head over there today and grab the audiobook, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. It's one of my all-time favorite books. So one last time, choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free by heading over to audible.com slash SMART or text SMART to 500-500. And now back to the episode. Nir, I have to ask you because that I, I could picture myself doing that. I actually know what would happen. About three minutes in, I'd be chomping at the bit to get back to the thing I want to do because I'd be bored with surfing that wave. It would have gone away. So I love that. What I want to then ask you is what are the other things we can do? Because you mentioned three things for this internal. Uh, and again, what do you refer to them as? The internal. Internal triggers. The internal triggers, right? Right. So um, one is kind of feel them. Uh, do you talk at all about even identifying what they are in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first step. We have to write them down. That's what that distraction tracker we talked about earlier is all about, where we're noting why we got distracted. So when we get to, so let's say you sit down at your desk, you say, okay, here I go. I'm going to write for 30 minutes, but then 10 minutes in, you find this, you have this urge to check your email. So what you're going to do is you're going to write down that sensation on a piece of paper right? Psychologists tell us that simply noting the sensation, writing it down is a first step to getting greater agency and control over it. You set a timer for 10 minutes. You tell yourself, I can either get back to the task at hand or just explore this sensation. Mm. And you have the very same insights you just had with me about what's going on here. What am I escaping from exactly? Sure. Is it, is it, you know, your brain is making up a story that if you don't check email, well, the, you know, who, who, what's going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something terrible yeah. might happen. We all know that's rubbish. That's not the case. Nothing's going to happen if you wait 30 minutes to check your email uh, or tune, tune out any uh, other potential external trigger. And so what you're going to do is to just sit that, with that sensation for those minutes. And look, if it's too much to do 10 minutes, start with five. The reason this is so important is because every time we get distracted, we are reinforcing our identity that we can't. We are reinforcing our self-image whether we acknowledge it or not, as liars. When you say you're going to do something and you don't, you are reinforcing your perception of yourself as being a liar. And I did this every day. And I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it now, but I would have never sent it, said it back then. Sure. I would say I was going to work out, but I didn't. I would say I was going to be fully present with my daughter, but I checked my phone. I would say I was going to work on that big project and yet I get distracted. I was lying to myself day in and day out. But when you live with personal integrity, when you become indistractable, when you become the kind of person who does what they say they're going to do, you start seeing yourself differently. And this was the common trait among the people who I interviewed who were indistractable. These were the kind of people who saw themselves as able to do what they said. And that's why they were so productive. They believed that they could. And so right. that's how we begin to reshape our self-image, which is so very important in terms of getting things done. Because as opposed to defaulting into some excuse, I'm a morning person, I'm an evening person, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm lazy, I'm tired, I'm not a good at this, whatever. We build our self-image to acknowledge that, yes, we can do this because we are indistractable. That is who we are now. Fantastic. There are two things I have to ask you. One, I love, and and it is in a lot of the, because I, I read a lot of the reviews about books just to see what how are other people taking it. And this idea that distraction is simply about escape and, 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 and what you mentioned about um, what we're really seeking is the absence of um, discomfort. Of, of, of discomfort. Mm -hmm. Do you see any value or do you know of the research seeing value in purposely putting yourself in high levels of discomfort to almost desensitize. And mm. what's really on the forefront of my mind is I'm sure you're familiar with this idea of cold water exposure and Wim Hof and things yeah. like that. And 
I did that for a winter and sure enough, I felt a physiological change. I, I felt a change in the way my brain worked. I felt, for example, I'd go outside, it'd be cold and I'd say, yeah, but I've dealt with colder totally. and then I'm legitimately not as cold. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, here's the thing, you know, we think of pain occurring in the body, right? So if you stub your toe, you think, oh my God, that pain is in my toe. But that, of course, is not happening. Your toe doesn't have a brain. It pain, All pain happens in the brain. <laughs> that is where pain occurs. Now, there might be damage to your toe, but it's still being registered and processed in your brain. And so the, the science of pain is fascinating, whether it's psychological pain or physiological pain, it is still all a, a phenomenon in our brains. And so how we change our set points based on how we react to that pain is incredibly important. I, you know, I'll give you a, a, a great example that just came to mind. So when my daughter was very young, she, uh, you know, we would take her to the park and she would run around, have, be having a great time. And once in a while she would trip and fall, you know, when she was first learning to, to, to her way on her feet and she sure. would trip and fall. And if my wife and I reacted with, Oh my God, honey, are you okay? She would cry right? Because she got the signal. She would always stop, you know, she would look at us, you know, <laughs> and if we said, oh my God, honey. And then she would say, oh, I guess I'm, I guess I, this was supposed to be painful. I'm going to cry. But if she, if we didn't acknowledge it and she was having a great time and her friends were running around too, she would fall sometimes really hard <laughs> and she would just get back up and she wouldn't feel the pain because her brain told, I mean, what's the purpose of pain? The purpose of pain is to prevent you from hurting yourself, right? right. But if it's not a real threat, if it's a fake threat, your brain tunes it out. In fact, your brain is tuning out all kinds of superfluous information right now. All kinds of stuff is happening in your body that if you focus on could be uncomfortable because you're not focused on it, you're listening to my vo voice instead, you don't experience that discomfort. And so absolutely, there, there is a lot to this process of helping teach the brain Yep, I might feel this discomfort. I might feel fear that someone is judging me. I might feel anxiety. I might feel stress. But you know what? that's not going to kill me. That's actually the process of growth. Yeah. That this process of overcoming that discomfort is how we get better at the task at hand. I love your story about kids because anybody who's a parent, even those who aren't, but have seen it, know that to a T and you're right. I mean, yeah. and so it is, it's a perfect example of that. I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I could not let you go without this question. You've mentioned it numerous times and values are a subject I'm fascinated by because mm. It's still in, in a lot of the research I've done, people I've talked to, it's still hard to nail down values, I think, because people get tripped up on, are these my values? Are they society's values? Are they my parents' values? Are, you know, and, and so I think we struggle sometimes even with that. And then yeah. your idea of turning your values into time. Tell us what you mean by that and maybe give us a, I know you can't give us all of it because of sure, time. Sure, happy to. If we, if we had more time, I'd, I'd recite the whole book to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, Tell us how we do that. Yeah, no, happy to. But I, so I think values are incredibly important. So let's, let's define what I mean by values. To me, values are defined as the attributes of the person you want to become. The attributes of the person you want to become. And I think what's so, what, what I think people miss the mark when it comes to values and how, how important these can be in your day to day life is that where values are most useful are in guiding your actions, not your aspirations but your actions, that's where values really matter. And so instead of making a vision board or a five-year plan or thinking about the regrets of the dying, right? How about we start with next week, okay? How do you wanna spend your time on earth in the week ahead to help you live out your values? Now, the reason this is so important is because it's so concrete that when we talk, I think the reason people have trouble with values is because they're so amorphous, right? I don't, I'm not really sure what my values are. Yeah. So the best way to understand what your values are is to turn them into time. And I talk about these three life domains. You have you at the center, you have your relationships, and then finally the last concentric circle is work. And so your job is to look at that calendar, and I'll give you a link for the show notes. Uh, there's, I built this tool to make it very easy for people to do. You don't have to sign up for anything. It's totally free. What you do is you want to look at your week ahead. There's this template that I give you, and you want to fill the time that allows you 
to live out your values. Turn your values into time, starting with the me domain. So first thing, probably the biggest chunk of time is adequate sleep. We know that sleep is incredibly important for your physical and psychological health. I don't need to tell you this. You've read it a million times. But are you making time for it? Not just for the sleep itself. Do you have time for the pre-sleep rituals that take time? You know, showering, brushing your teeth. That stuff needs to be on your calendar as well, right? Mm -hmm. Not to the, to the minute, but have a block of time that says 20 minutes prep for bed. Okay, but if you want to get to bed at 10, make sure that you're starting those 20 minutes, 20 minutes before 10 o'clock. Then, you know, other things in the me domain, if, if uh, physical health is one of your values, if that's part of the attributes of the, of the person you want to become, well, do you have time for proper exercise and nutrition in your day? I'm not saying that needs to be your value. I'm not going to judge what your value should be. Only you can decide your values. But if that is one of your values, is it in your calendar? When it comes to spiritual or uh, growing your uh, spiritual growth or growing your knowledge base, do you have time for that in your day? Do you have time for audiobooks or a course or, or prayer or meditation or painting or taking walks? Whatever it is that you want to do in your life, do you have that time first and foremost? The second, the second domain is the relationship domain. You know, right now we have an epidemic of loneliness in this country. And psychologists tell us that loneliness is as detrimental to our health as smoking and obesity. And the reason this crisis is occurring is because we have had a collapse in the social institutions that used to hold the place on people's calendars. The Kiwanis Club, the church group, the bowling league, this stuff used to be held on our calendars. And as these groups have declined, people don't have these regular occasions to see friends. And that is leading to this epidemic of loneliness. It started way before Facebook. People like to blame it on Facebook. That's, that's not true. Robert mm -hmm. Putnam wrote about this in the 1990s. So this is a long-term trend. We have to put that time for our important relationships on our calendar, or we're not going to get to the get together with people that who we like and who like us. So that has to be on your calendar as well, as well as time with your kids, with your spouse. That needs time on your calendar as well, if these are among your values. And then last, this is where most people start, but I argue it should be last, is the work domain. So do you have time in your calendar, of course, for the mundane stuff like time boxing your email or the meetings in your day? But also, you know, if your job requires you to think, right, and, and the vast majority of people's jobs require them to think, right, you're not an automaton, you need to strategize, you need to plan, you need to think, is that time on your calendar? Can you do that without distraction? I'm not saying you have to do it all day, but do you have 30 minutes, an hour, 45 minutes in your day to do that focused work, that reflective time? You have to have that on your calendar as well. And so this is how we turn our values into time, not with some highfalutin five-year plan, Let's just start with next week to live out our values so that we can turn our values into time. I love that. I've actually, I've heard two quotes that are very similar, but it's show me your, it's sh basically show me your credit card statement and I'll mm -hmm. show you your values and also show me your calendar and I'll show you your values. That's right. And, and both to some extent are exactly what you're talking about. I mm -hmm. couldn't agree more. And man, we have just touched the surface of what is included in your incredible book. And I, first of all, really appreciate you giving us this knowledge so, so freely and so, um, you know, so articulately. Thank uh, you. But My pleasure. That you want to dive in and there is much more, right? It, you talk about work and how to, how to bring this idea to work and to change the culture and to talk to your boss. Your new book is indistractable, how to control your attention and choose your life near before we let you go. Where can our listeners go learn more? Where is that free tool? Where can we Absolutely. get more uh, from you on this? Yeah, thank you. So my website is nearandfar.com, but near is spelled like my first name. So that's N-I-R and far.com, near and far.com. And if you want specific information about the book, the book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And if you go to indistractable.com, not only will you find that tool, I'll, I'll give you the link as well for the show notes, but you can find uh, there's an 80 page workbook that we actually cut from the manuscript. The, the book ended up being too long. So we actually put it separately and you can get that for free. That's completely complimentary. There's also, if you do end up getting the book, make sure you submit your order number because there's a free video course that you can also get that's complimentary at uh, indistractable.com. And that's spelled I N the word distract a B L E. So indistractable. Com. Well, obviously you are indistractable to be able to write a book that is 80 pages too long. Plus, <laughs> course. So I, I know I have to learn this stuff so I can finally ship the things that are in my brain that I think will serve the world. And I know our listeners want to do that too. So with Absolutely. that here, I really appreciate your time. 
Thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. This one sneaks in as one of my favorite interviews of 2019. Really hope that you enjoyed that episode with Nir Ayal. His book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life, can be found on Amazon or at your local bookstore. And also, I have to recommend his older book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. It's pretty awesome. And of course, you can use our Amazon link located at smartpeopledpodcast.com slash Amazon. And any purchase you make through that link comes at no extra cost to you, and it greatly helps support the show. If you're looking for other free and easy ways to support the show, you can always just leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. We're on Patreon, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. And if you want to sign up for the newsletter, you can always head over to the site smartpeoplepodcast.com. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. All right, that's it for us this week. We're going to start winding things down. I hope you have a fantastic holiday season with friends and family. We've got one more episode coming up before year end. So make sure you stay tuned and we'll see you all next episode.